I want to take a moment to uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, in 2006, when the University of Wyoming founded the uh, School of Energy Resources, one of the first people they hired was Dr. Bruce Parkinson. Um, since then, he has worked with the school and uh, its director and helped hire uh, more than 12 uh, other uh, faculty members. The School of Energy Resources has uh, a broad mandate for research in traditional sources of energy and also to the, the, for the development of new ones. They're focused on everything from uh, enhanced oil recovery, uh, environmental reclamation, carbon management, energy economics, and of course the development of new energy sources like solar power and wind power. Uh, Dr. Bruce Parkinson is the J.E. Warren Professor of Energy and Environment. Uh, he has a joint appointment in what we call SER, School of Energy Resources, and the Department of Chemistry. And when you read his uh, CV and, and list of publications, you cannot avoid the notion that he is a chemist uh, at heart. <laughs> he earned his PhD from the California Institute of Technology in 1977 and has spent his life as a researcher and a teacher. Uh, internationally known as an expert in solar energy and in particular in photoelectric chemistry, uh, Dr. Parkinson is one of the nation's top people in renewable energy research and innovation. Since the 1970s, he has led a research group that seeks to identify novel methods to harness solar energy and new voltaic, photovoltaic materials that can be used to make solar energy usable. Uh, Dr. Parkinson is known for his ability to translate high-level specialist knowledge of chemistry into accessible language for his students and non-specialist audience. Uh, while he writes articles with titles I can barely decipher, um, <laughs> one whose at least I can pronounce all of the words in it uh, came out in 2010 uh, with the title, Multiple Exciton Collection in a Sensitivized Photovoltaic System. Um, despite that, uh, <laughs> Dr. Parkinson is also known for creating uh, SE, the SER majors <laughs> Uh, introductory course, a 1,000 level course designed for students uh, both in SER and in our uh, Institute of Environment and Natural Resources, and uh, he teaches that uh, to, uh, to a good audience of essentially freshman students, uh, and they continue to learn a lot from him. So, Dr. Parkinson. Okay, well, thanks very much for the uh, very uh, nice introduction. I'm glad he didn't go through all the places I've been, because that would have taken another half of the time that I need, and I'm gonna have to talk fast to get through what I wanna say. But I certainly wanna start with thanking the Wyoming Humanities Council for organizing this and inviting me. It's my first time in Jackson, and what a beautiful place. Again, thank our hosts last night for a wonderful reception, and everybody that's involved in organizing this event here. So it's a real honor to be here. So usually I'm talking at a symposium that's a very focused symposium and the subjects are all kind of the same and it's pretty easy to make a connection between the first talk and my talk or the, you know, whatever, whenever my talk comes in. I really was struggling during Jerry's talk. How am I gonna make a connection here? It's the only thing I could think of, which is hopeful, and that is, Boy, I hope in 40 years when we look back at our energy system now, we think, boy, those people were backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get right, right, go, right going. Here's a quick outline. We're gonna look at our current energy use. We are, where are we now? Uh, well, what is, uh, what is the future gonna look like? And especially what are the implications of what we call business as usual. Uh, then, as academics can't uh, resist talking about our own research, so we'll work on towards alternatives to business as usual and then some research in my lab that relates to something we call the hydrogen economy. Okay, so where are we now? This is a graph, you know, we're gonna have some science in here. I tried to keep the graphs to a minimum, but they're gonna be a lot of but I did eliminate all equations, so. 
Okay, so here we go. This is from 1986 for users that can't see to 2011. Here is a graph of all of the different sources of energy used in the world. Uh, so we see there's a continuous rise in energy use. We have coal here is this band. You see this tiny little band here? That's renewable. So that's where we are now. You know, we might see a lot of wind farms and solar photovoltaics out there. But in the overall picture, it's very, very small right now. Uh, nuclear power is also this band here. And then we've got natural gas and oil. So if you look here, fossil fuels really dominates our energy use currently. The only things that might be carbon free is this much right here, nuclear, hydro, and renewables. All right, so turns out everybody's talking about we're going to run out of oil, we're going to run out of gas. And that's true, eventually we will. They are finite resources. But if you look at oil, for instance, there are estimates of how many years we have left of oil at current rates of usage. And they rank from as low as 30 to as high as 150. Now, the one, these high values for gas, 60 to 600, coal, 100 to maybe even 2,000 years. On this end, we got the easy to extract. So this does not include tar sands and shale oil, which are already starting to be exploited. That extends oil quite a bit. So up here, these are the harder to extract, more expensive. Tar sands and shale oil are much harder to extract than Saudi Arabia. One well produces for years very clean crude that you load on tankers and send around the world. So the point is, we're not about to run out of oil. We're, we're running out of easy oil, which means that the price is going to go up because there's more and more demand. It's harder and harder to keep extracting it. But still, if this were our only concern, we could put a, this problem of energy off for quite a few years. And we wouldn't have to deal with it for at least 100 years, probably. But there's this little bit, little problem right here. We're looking at the, here, the atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide, and I have three time scales here. Up in the left, up in the upper right-hand corner here, we have thousands of years before the present, going back to 400,000 years. This data comes from ice cores. Turns out there's a really nice climate record preserved in ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica. You drill down in the ice, you find bubbles that are trapped in the ice, you analyze the gas in those bubbles, and it tells you what the carbon dioxide concentration was in the atmosphere. And that's on this axis over here. So this is the carbon dioxide level in the red curve. On the left-hand side is the temperature. And they can actually infer the temperature that that ice was formed at by looking at isotopic ratios. So there's some heavier water, which tends to form snow and ice before lighter water. So oxygen-18 is the heavier isotope. That fractionation is actually quite small, but quite easily measured. So here is temperature based on that. And notice how, for the last 400,000 years, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has tracked the global average temperature. Quite remarkable for these two separate measures to track each other that much. And actually, now they've gone back farther, 400,000 years. So some of these, where, where we're in between these peaks, those are the, uh, the glacial periods. The global average temperature was much lower. And a large part of the continental US was covered in thick ice. So these types of temperature changes here, this is only, this is eight degrees C, up plus and minus. So, so those types of, of temperature changes can cause global implications. It's one of the lessons. All right, the next time scale is this one. Here we are 800, B, this is 800, year 800. And here we are today, 2000. It's a, it's a little blip on this act thing. And so this is basically pre, prehistoric well, pre-industrial revolution, I should say. And then the industrial revolution happens, and CO2 starts to go up very quickly. 
And of course, we're off the axis here, and here's, here's where we are today. And here we are today on this scale. So this is 400,000 years, and now suddenly, in a matter of a second on this time scale, the global CO2 atmospheric concentration has just gone up like a delta function, we call it in mathematics. Okay, well then we can look at another time scale. This is just since 1960. And it turned out in about that time, there was a guy named Keeling. And he wanted to find out, well, what is the real concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? And he went up to the top of the Hawaiian volcano, Mauna Loa, where you get pristine mixed air that's totally mixed coming across the Pacific, no power plants upwind or no forests pulling out the CO2. And he started measuring it. And the first thing he found are there are these interesting cycles, which are due to the summer in the northern hemisphere removing carbon dioxide. So photosynthesis and it's mostly algae in the ocean, but, but the forests in the northern hemisphere. And then in the winter it would build up. But after he started measuring this for a few years, he noticed that this is increasing every year. And again, from isotopic measurements, that is looking at the types of carbon that make up the carbon dioxide, carbon uh, 14, carbon uh, 13, and carbon 12, you could tell that this is coming from fossil fuels because it's been sequestered in the earth for a long time and all of its natural radioactivity is basically gone and so now we're putting in a lot of different isotopes than what are naturally produced by cosmic rays. All right, so we see this and now here we're off this graph too now. I looked, you can look just like the stock market, you can watch this on, online. <laughs> you can find your monthly CO2 and, and I just checked January 2013 was the last one they posted. We're now at 395.5 parts per million and pre-industrial levels were about 275. And we've done this in a matter of uh, basically 150 years. So on the glacial period timescale, this is a microsecond. I mean, this is an instantaneous change. The globe has never seen a change this quickly over this short amount of time in carbon dioxide concentrations. All right, so from those trends, we see that our carbon dioxide concentration is increasing at about 0.4% per year. Year after year, it's actually accelerating because economies are developing. We'll see that. Leading CO2 producers in the world. The U.S. was recently passed by China as the leading CO2 producer in the world. But in the Wyoming perspective, this is a little, and so, you know, we're 24% of global CO2 production. We're 6% of world population. So we're doing more than our share here. I mean, China has passed us, but of course they have four times as many people as we do. Okay, now here's Wyoming. All right, Wyoming inter it originates 20% of US CO2. Therefore, Wyoming, our state, half a million people, four to 5% of global CO2 started out in Wyoming. Because we're high in oil, we're high in gas, and we're really high in coal. A way to remember Wyoming coal, 100 coal trains a day, 100 cars in each coal train, 100 tons of coal in each car, 1 million tons per day, every day. Actually, it's more, 425 million tons a year coming out of just Wyoming, which is great for the economy, it's jobs, it's no income tax, no income tax because of the severance tax that comes back to the state from the federal government. We don't need it because we got this nice natural resource. We got hundreds of years of it. All right, so here are the other players. You can see not, you know, Western Europe, China, and the US, and the whole rest of the world is maybe uh, 35%. So the, the point is here, though, that most scientists now agree that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. That means it captures energy that's absorbed by the Earth before it's re-radiated back into space. And so that capturing of that long wavelength light, the infrared energy, that the heat energy that's coming back off the Earth from the solar warming, 
is not escaping into space as fast as it usually does, and so it's building up in the Earth very slowly. And people can model this quite well. And in, we'll, we'll talk about it too, that it is really, the temperature, average global temperature really is increasing. All right, so what are the effects of this global warming? Well, some of the world's largest and fastest computers are used to simulate this climate. There is some disagreement with the models, but most of the models agree that this is, there's a warming, and the warming is directly attributable to the CO2 that's emitted by our civilization. In fact, these climate modelers a few years ago were, were accused of being alarmist. But the actual trends have exceeded their predictions in temperature. Most of these models predict that when we get to about 550, remember we're just about to hit 400, starting at 275, really bad things could happen. It turns that, I already mentioned this, the rate of change of temperature in CO2 is, is increasing at unprecedented rates in the last 650,000 years. But climate also has been known to make some radical jumps. So it's called a chaotic system. So you can get into some nice pattern for a while, and then it can jump to some new pattern. And there's evidence for this in the Gulf Stream. That is, when there was a large melting of the Greenland ice cap, the Gulf Stream was diverted by the cold, dense water that was produced in the northern ocean. And Europe cooled a whole lot, even though that the whole globe was warming. Locally, you could have some really big effects because the flows of water and air are disrupted, uh, like a, a major current, the Gulf Stream, was actually diverted. And they could tell this from sediment records in, in the uh, northern oceans and in, in uh, alluvial plains. There's no doubt the ice caps are melting, the sea level is rising, and alpine glaciers are retreating. For every glacier that's holding its own, there are 10 to 100 that are retreating. Sea level, okay, some countries will be inundated. Places like Bangladesh, Pacific Islands, and maybe parts of Florida. Maybe major changes in rainfall distribution. We've had a drought in the last couple of years. Could be a seasonal thing. There have been droughts in the past. Could just be that in another few years we're back to rainfall. And climate scientists tend to be somewhat, you know, scientists in general are a bit conservative. You can always tell the climate scientists, they're always saying, well, Superstorm Standy, and we're talking here about more stronger hurricanes, may or may not be a result of global warming, but those types of storms are more likely under a warming scenario because storms get their energy from warm water, and the oceans have been warming again, very accurate me measurements conclusively show that the oceans are warming. So the analogy I liked was, uh, well, when Barry Bonds hit a home run, you couldn't say that that home run was caused by him using steroids. <laughs> but you could kind of look at how many he hit and how fast, and you could say, yeah, probably a result of taking the steroids. So now the climate might be on steroids, right? <laughs> All right. So I talked about the ocean. This is the big one that you don't really hear much. I mean, we see it here. We see beetle kill. Beetle kill in the mountains is a result of less harsh wilt, uh, temperatures in the winter at high altitudes, not killing the beetle larvae. So they survive the winter and multiply to, to infest more trees. The people in our Environmental Natural Resources College study the fact that uh, species are moving that are warmer weather species are moving to higher altitudes and higher altitude species can just disappear because they're forced off of their their ecosystem. This is the one you don't hear so much about that it's really scary. Carbon dioxide dissolves in water to form carbonic acid which is why carbonated drinks have a slightly acidic uh, pH. There's more protons, more acid in there. And many sea creatures cannot survive if the ocean pH gets a little bit more acid 
because calcium carbonate, which is what they make their shells out of, dissolves in acid. One of the favorite high school chemistry experiments is to put some acid into uh, baking soda and it produces huge amounts of carbon dioxide and you can make rockets and all kinds of things by doing that. Well, a lot of these species that are going to be not be able to make their shells, and coral is dying maybe partly already due to this. That's the, one of the bases of the food chain in the ocean. So entire ecosystems in the ocean, in principle, could collapse. And there ain't nothing you're going to do about changing the pH of the ocean once it's too acid. There's no amount of base that you could jump in there to re reduce to reduce that. So, a little bit of here's so kind of this is where we are. Uh, I like this. Uh, now that the now that fossil fuel has melted the ice cap, we can drill for more fossil fuels. <laughs> this is another favorite quote of mine. This is Upton Sinclair, a kind of liberal activist. Older people might have been required to read him. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends on not understanding it. And you can have sympathy. If you're a coal miner now, it's a good job. It's a good economic boost for the state of Wyoming. But maybe it's going to be like the firemen on the trains, a job that's hopefully no longer needed in the future. But we're going to look at the future now. I like to quote this famous philosopher, Yogi Berra. It's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> but we're going to look at this now a little bit. It turns out there was a very, a very influential paper published in Nature, one of the top science journals, the, one of the general science journals everybody likes to get papers in, 1998, so this is 15 years ago, where he called uh, Energy Implications of Future Atmospheric Stabilization of CO2 Content. And here we're going to get into a little bit of, of quantitative work here. So what, what uh, Martin did is he looked at what's going to affect energy use in the world. And of course, the first thing is how many people there are. More pe everybody uses energy. You know, we in the US use more energy per capita than just about anybody. But you know, you got a billion people in China that don't use as much, but it still adds up, and people in India and all that. So, Population. So here's where he was in, when he published this. They had this world population at about 5 billion. And he predicts that by 2100, this will level off at 11 billion. People tend to have smaller families as their country develops. So hopefully we reach some kind of a stabilized population on the world. And their guess is about 11 billion. Again, this is a total extrapolation and actually somewhat conservative in terms of the, uh, or maybe optimistic, I would say. All right, the next is, uh, you will use energy based on the gross domestic product. The US has a really big gross domestic, gross domestic product per capita, so we use a lot. But if you take the whole world, and the whole world is developing, that means all these people in India and China are going to start using more energy per capita as they buy cars, basically, and give houses with air conditioners. And that's going to be the big deal in the future. A billion Chinese and Indians driving SUVs. Think of that. All right, so what he said is if you look over the last uh, decades, we find that uh, the gross domestic, gross domestic product per capita has been growing about 1.6% per year on average. There's some slow and higher periods. So he just extrapolated out. It's going to continue to grow. China's grown a whole lot faster than that. So he was a little bit conservative again in his extrapolation in this case. Now thirdly, he was also saying that, well, especially during the 50s and so, we were using energy pretty wastefully. We had these big gas guzzler cars. and. Air conditioners were really inefficient, and refrigerators were really inefficient, and so we were being pretty wasteful. Our houses weren't insulated very well. But remember the oil crisis, 1970, everybody, suddenly the world started using energy more efficiently. So this is a, a measure of basically the energy use per unit of gross domestic product. 
So that means we can still have the same output of the economy with less energy. And he, again, optimistically says, well, this will continue at a percent per year of increasing our efficiency. Of course, thermodynamics tells you you can't increase it beyond certain levels. There are limits. So again, fairly optimistic. All right, here's his last factor that he had put into his prediction of future energy use was, what's the amount of carbon per unit energy that we produce emitted? So of course, if we have hydroelectric, we get very little carbon emitted per unit of energy. But if we're burning coal, we have this line here. This is the higher line, amount of energy per, or amount of CO2 per unit energy. Coal is by far the worst. There's no hydrogen in coal, like in gasoline or natural gas. So it's all carbon to CO2. No energy as a result of the fact that there's hydrogen in there, like in natural gas, CH4. You get two water molecules, so you're basically burning uh, hydrogen as well as you are burning carbon. And so you see gas, natural gas, has got the most hydrogen and is the least carbon intensive. So Martin actually did this very optimistic thing that we're going to get so many renewables and more nuclear power so that we're going to be, by the middle of the century, below natural gas. Well, he blew it completely because we've actually turned this around. China building a coal plant every three to four days. Might even be faster. So the US, we're starting to phase out a few coal plants, but in China, they're building them like crazy because their economy's booming. They have coal, but they can even use more. They're looking at ways to send Wyoming coal to, to China. Australia sends huge amounts of coal to China. So this, this optimistic thing is actually turned around. Our carbon in the world, intensity of our energy system is increasing. All right, so he puts all that together and comes up with this. And I'm, this is going to take a little bit of time, but I'm going to go fast, but ask questions later. So here's what he did. Here's where he did it, 1998. This number is, in 1998, we were using about 10 or 11 terawatts of power in the, in the world. All right, you say, well, watts, that's a power unit, where energy is what, in, in science, we would put it in joules. But so what we're to kind of make an easy unit here, we just take the total amount of energy used in the world and divide it by the number of seconds in a year. And then we get the average power that the, U, the world is using at any given time, averaged over a year. So that was then 11 terawatts. Now in 2012, we were up to about 17. So already we've gone up quite a bit in just the last decade. And so he predicted this is what the world will need as it develops. And he optimistically said, you know, back here, remember this is renewables. Well, he said that by now it would grow to this big chunk, and it hasn't at all. We're still basically almost in the noise. He also predicted that nuclear power, this blue band, would grow and continue to grow. And we are thinking about it, but nuclear power in the world has not grown. It's shrunk, if anything. Germany's going offline. Japan has a bunch of plants shut down. All right, so here again is gas, oil, and coal, and he's optimistic that, well, oil is going to peak, and gas was going to peak, and coal was going to continue to be used. Turns out, right about here is when natural gas actually started to come way up because of fracking. So he was kind of off on these things. But given that, here's the curve that we'll probably be on in terms of energy use from that, again, optimistic extrapolation of all those four factors. And so here is then uh, what he expects that we need from renewables in order to uh, meet one of these estimates. And these numbers are the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, given these scenarios. So basically, what you have to do is go between this line and this line to find out how much renewables we need by this period in order to stabilize the climate with 350 parts per million of CO2. This line would be 450, this line would be 550. Remember I said 550 is the kind of the catastrophic part, the CO2 cliff perhaps? So okay, if we even with his optimistic assumptions, we get to 2045, 
we need 16 terawatts of carbon-free power to stabilize the climate at 550. So that's basically equivalent to all of the energy use currently combined that we need in carbon-free power by then in order to prevent doubling atmospheric CO2 from pre-industrial concentrations. It's all oil, all gas, all those things together. We need that much carbon-free by then. Pretty eye-opening. And here's just the CO2 implications of that uh, in terms of temperature. So again, predictions based on scenarios. If you had a complete uh, huge tax on carbon, we could actually reduce our carbon emissions by the mid-century, but we're not. We're already right on this curve here. This is blowing up this part. So we're right on this prediction, which is going to be probably one of these curves. This is no, no restrictions on carbon whatsoever, and this one is some restrictions on carbon. This is very strong restrictions down here. So we're probably going to be somewhere in here, which is, here's 550. So by mid-century, we're going to be passing that. And that then means by mid-century here, we are going to have three to four degrees Fahrenheit increase in average global temperatures. Again, there's going to be local effects. It's not going to be just everywhere all the time that much warmer. And if we really are bad, we could be by the next century, beginning of the next century, up to six degrees hot, warmer, global average. So all for its conclusions here. They underscore the pitfalls of waiting, wait and see. Well, maybe it's just a natural climate variation. Well, maybe not. Without the policy incentives to overcome socioeconomic inertia, development of needed technologies will likely not occur soon enough to allow capitalization on a 10 to 30 watt scale by 2050. And that's only been reinforced by the fact that he thought we'd have this really big onset already, which didn't happen. Research in developing and commercializing carbon-free primary power technologies capable of this by mid-21st century could require efforts perhaps international, pursued with the urgency of the Manhattan Project or the Apollo Space Program. And this was back when these had very optimistic assumptions. And none of those optimistic assumptions, almost none, are really... So we're actually behind this curve. All right, so uh, let's look at the alternatives here. Well, carbon-free, the best thing we can do is, con is conservation. It's the low-hanging fruit. It could be done tomorrow. We have the technology. It's just a matter of implementing it. The obvious things, luckily we've done, uh, vehicle, mi vehicle mileage in increases, house insulation, that's low-hanging fruit, saves energy for the whole life of that structure if you don't waste it. Uh, compact fluorescence and LED lighting saves huge amounts of energy. pays for itself really well, so, but you know, the government should not interfere in your choice of light bulbs. But, uh. <laughs> All right, so solar, thermal, and photovoltaic. Th these are being developed, not on the scale and as fast as we need. Wind is terrific. Almost, it pretty much pays for itself now. You give it some tax credits. Get the economies of scale going. We can expand wind. Biomass, sometimes, sometimes not. Corn ethanol, probably not. Nuclear, it's non-renewable. But it is an interim solution, especially if we want to go to electric vehicles. Carbon-free way to supply electricity for electric vehicles. There are issues with it. Safety, waste, proliferation, not in my backyard. But basically, we need all of these and more. So. Potential, hydroelectric, geothermal, wind, biomass, solar, all of these and more. Problem with the hydro, we pretty much maxed it out worldwide. The Three Gorges Dam in China, probably the last huge hydro project ever, and it could only have been done in China. 
you're going to move a million and a half people out of the way of your project. In the US, you'd have a million and a half class action or a million and a half lawsuits, right? <laughs> All right, wind, best current technology, but not enough where power is needed. North Dakota, Wyoming, we're full of wind, but nobody lives here. <laughs> and, or there, well, more and more people, but they're a long way from where the big consumers are, and you lose power when you transmit at long distances. Biomass, food, water, energy balance, pollution, corn ethanol, one of the worst ideas to come along. Uh, biomass worked in Brazil with very different constraints than growing corn on the Great Plains. Okay, solar is really the only technology with virtually unlimited potential, but it has a problem. Right now it's expensive and it doesn't store energy very long. Some of the solar thermal will get some storage, but only for a few hours often. But over 75% of the energy use, as you saw, was fuel-based. And so if the sun doesn't shine at night, it might be cloudy. Same with wind, it might not be windy. You're not going to put sunshine in your car to run it, and photovoltaics on top of your car aren't going to run it unless it's electric and you have a lot of photovoltaics to charge your car with. So we need a way to convert sunlight to stored energy in case of fuel. So the potential of solar energy, I say, is huge. So remember, we use in the tens of terawatts. Well, the solar energy in input is 120,000 terawatts. So we only need to use a tiny fraction of this in order to supply all of our energy demands. More practically, and if you look at unused land and where it is, so you want to put it in places where there's lots of sun, like deserts and such, probably 600 terawatts. But that's still 10 times, 20 times what, what we would need. And, but, uh, you know, there's still issues. Uh, this, for instance, here, I like to put this up. This is two, two megawatts of solar, which, of course, is only delivering two megawatts when the sun is out. A typical coal-fired plant, like in the Four Corners or in Wyoming, south of here, that's about 500 gig, uh, megawatts, 500 megawatts. So that means to make one coal-fired plant, you need 200 times that area. One big coal-fired plant. So that's a large area. And the whole thing with solar is you pay basically on the, how much area you have to cover, right? All right, so photosynthesis globally is 90 terawatts. So if we're going to use biomass to get 10 or 20, we'd have to use a huge percentage of all photosynthesis on Earth basically to do that. So, you know, if you can use biomass for waste and get some energy, great, but you can't hang your hat on biomass saving the world especially when it comes down to rich people driving cars and poor people not eating because the biomass is converted for, diverted from food. And again, 70% is energy, it's, it's fuel. All right, so here we get down to, the, I say, the most important chemical reaction for the future. Water plus sunlight equals hydrogen and oxygen. You might have seen a demo where this was done in, back, in the other direction. You get some pretty impressive displays of energy release. And we know how to do that in a controlled fashion, but we don't know how to do this very efficiently. So it stores energy. The Department of Energy is actually putting a fair amount of effort into this. They have established the solar hub, 25 million a year for five years at Caltech, to try to develop a direct from sunlight to fuel uh, process. And that's basically what my research is, is about. So here is then, if we can do that reaction, we generate hydrogen. Hydrogen is a very nice fuel. It has some advantages and some disadvantages. But you could, in principle, base your entire energy fuel-based economy on hydrogen. Maybe not airplanes. But if you just took airplanes out of the mix, you had to use hydrocarbons there, we'd probably be OK. Because we can run cars on hydrogen. This is a Honda Clarity. This is a wonderful car that you can lease now in Southern California 
but only if you li live near a hydrogen fueling station. This thing has a 100 kilowatt fuel cell in it, has a 240 mile range, and it gets 60 miles per kilogram of hydrogen. Quiet, because of, it uses a fuel cell, something that convert, does that reaction backwards in a very controlled fashion to give electricity back. So it's pr probably the uh, car of the future. How far in the future, we don't know. But here was a, a picture then of kind of an ideal residence that was drawn up in the, at the, solar, well, the National Renewable Energy Lab, where you have a house that's still connected to the grid. It has maybe some PV photovoltaics on the roof producing electricity. It has some hydrogen storage tanks under here because you can take excess electricity and put it in an electrolyzer and electrolyze water with just electrical energy to get hydrogen, which you could store. And you have a fuel cell that you could actually convert energy back when it's not so sunny, or you could also send energy out to the grid. We have a smart grid at this point. Or you could store the hydrogen to fuel your fuel cell car if you had excess energy. So it's pretty nice if this could be done. Of course, you'd have to have some larger installations. You don't have enough sun. If you have some wind, you could have a wind turbine out back, too, that's also connected to the grid. So my research actually is trying to do what the photovoltaic cells and the electrolyzer do in one thing instead of two. So both of these things, photovoltaic cells on your roof, those are somewhat expensive. And it turns out electrolyzers are not cheap either. They contain platinum and precious metals and expensive membranes and those sorts of things. So we have this very long range research project of trying to, uh, to uh, replace those ten things with one, one uh, device. So we, st we solved the storage problem. Water is an abundant material. Water and sunlight are accessible to everyone, so you won't have the, the hydrogen cartel controlling the distribution price of hydrogen. Uh, but now hydrogen is, it is actually manufactured on a large scale in the petroleum and chemical industry, but they make it from methane now. So they take the, the hydrogen out of CH4. Uh, we can burn hydrogen in internal combustion engines. Better way to do it is a fuel cell. A fuel cell is more efficient than an internal combustion engine. Uh, the, the theoretical efficiency is much higher, so it would go much farther. Produces water vapor when you're done. So water to water, no pollution. But it's an energy carrier, not an energy source. We cannot mine it. On the plus side, it's the highest energy content of any fuel per unit weight. But it's very low per unit volume because it's a gas, and a very light gas. So we have to solve some problems there. So there's three basic uh, research things that are needed. One, we need to improve fuel cells. Transportation is a large fuel use. So if we can make fuel cells and we can get the platinum out of them, that would be a big advance. We could make fuel cells cheap. Uh, the membranes in the fuel cells are also somewhat expensive and not as durable as they need, so there's research going on in this here. Better hydrogen storage. It turns out the high-pressure tanks are making great strides. As you saw, that Honda Clarity had a pretty nice range, 200 plus miles on a fill. And I kind of hoped that the world would say, well, I usually get 500 on my tank of gas, but if I stopped a little more often for hydrogen, I could save the world, maybe that would, okay. that, maybe that would work, right? All right, so the big one, though, is well, there's hydrogen infrastructure. This is a chicken and the egg. That's the problem with the Honda Clarity. You couldn't lease one in Wyoming because there aren't any hydrogen fueling stations. And of course, there won't be any hydrogen fueling stations until there are fuel cell cars out there. So that infrastructure has to get uh, bootstrapped and also pipelines. We can retrofit natural gas pipelines to carry hydrogen. You can't use them as they are, but you could retrofit them. But here's the biggie, renewable source of hydrogen from water and sunlight, the most abundant fuel or abundant energy source for the future. This hydrogen idea is really not new. Jules Verne, a new renewable science fiction writer in 1874. Yes, my friends, I believe that water will one day be employed as fuel, that hydrogen and oxygen, which constituted, used singly or together, will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light of an intensity of which coal is not capable. Water will be the coal of the future. 
1874. Okay, so here we got solar energy, here we got hydrogen, how could we get there? I'm not going to go through this. Of course, if you make electricity from heat or wind, you can go to there for the electrolysis. We're trying to do it over here, directly from photolysis or photoelectrolysis to hydrogen. What would one of these devices perhaps look like? And this is a kind of a naive chemist's picture because a chemical engineer would look at this and say, well, you're, you're missing a lot of the valves and pressure and, and all the things, the flows that chemical engineers are good at. But this is very simple. So this is a window. We bring sunlight in here. We've got two electrodes that are made out of it, what do we call semiconductor materials. These are very similar to what's in a photovoltaic solar cell. Silicon in a, in a photovoltaic cell is a semiconductor. It has the ability to absorb sunlight and turn it into electrical charges that can move and do work. So what we do here is we skip the electricity and we go right from the charges that are generated by the sunlight to oxidize water on this side and reduce water on this side. And we can split the sunlight by absorbing only the blue wavelengths on this side and let the red ones uh, pass through and produce hydrogen on this side by producing the electrons that you need. And then we put gas out up here and this, this is a cross section, so you would notice this would be very much like PV panels tilted up towards the sun. And you know, my dream vision would be, of course, that you would have fields with photovoltaics producing electricity and then a corresponding area nearby covered with hydrogen producing <laughs> cells that are then storing that solar energy for transportation and nighttime uses and such things. But this is still a dream. And one of the biggest problems is we don't know e either of these materials. None are known that are stable that will do that job. After all, this, this material must actually absorb a large fraction of the solar wavelengths. So it's got to be probably black. At, at, so, the, so it's two materials together have to look black. That absorbs all the light. Have to be stable for many years under illumination in an aqueous electrolyte. This is a biggie. Uh, I ask, always ask people, how often do you paint your house? Every five, six years, maybe? And so that's a material that has to be out in sunlight and water for years and be exposed to the elements, not even an electrolyte, which is what rusts your car, the salt on the road. And you have to replace that every five or six years. This material is going to have to last longer than that in a much more challenging environment. Okay, Must, Okay. this is a, a chemistry thing that is the electrons that you produce with the light have to be negative enough, reducing enough, energetic enough to take protons and turn them into hydrogen. And on the other side, you have to be able to oxidize the water. That's, this is more of an esoteric part. Be nice if these things were like platinum and, and had some acti catalytic activity. That means they easily produce that reaction to, to make hydrogen from water. But also, it has to be cheaper than the solid state solar cell connected to the electrolyzer. We can already do that right now, and it's way too expensive. So that's why we're looking into this. All right, so about 10 years ago, I'd been doing a lot of solar energy research, and I'd been working on materials that really weren't stable in electrolytes in sunlight. And I thought, about the time I was reading Martin Hofford's paper that, gee, I better start thinking about something that'll have an impact. I, I still do basic science, but I like to have my sights out farther, my hopeful, optimistic part that if I solve this problem, it might make a difference. So I switched to using metal oxides, metal oxide semiconductors, because I made this simple analogy. Uh, you go out and you look at the rocks, they're pretty stable in sunlight and water and over a long time, and all of those rocks are oxides. When you have sulfide rocks, they generally turn into oxides once they're exposed to water and sunlight. All right, so we have to have an oxide semiconductor. But which oxide? I saw, we don't know of material yet that can do this. Well, there are about 60 metals in the periodic table. And we've looked at all of their simple oxides. So aluminum oxide and iron oxide and those things aren't quite the holy grail. 
mostly investigated. Well, let's say I got to make a little more fancy material. I'm going to put in three different metals. And let's say I just say I'm going to put only one atom of each in my oxide. Of course, in chemistry, we can put in two of one, one of the other, three of the other, four. You know, we have lots of what we call stoichiometries that we could make. But let's just make it simple. Say we're just going to look at all the one to one to one metal oxides, a ternary, we would call it. Well, that would be about 34,000 experiments. But then if I went to one to two to one, there'd be another 34,000 experiments. And I don't think my graduate student would be too happy if I, oh, you go do all the one to one to ones, and the next guy, you're going to do the one to two to twos. And... <laughs> but if we have to go to four, now it gets into the millions and billions, because this is, again, only the one to one to one to ones. Actually, I should have put another, well, no, I should put another one there. And so therefore, it uh, becomes a, a very large problem to try to discover this material. Uh, I make a, I don't know if you, anybody here's whole, there's these extraordinary materials called high temperature superconductors that are oxides. These are materials that conduct electricity with no resistance, but at only at fairly low temperatures. Well, the, everybody wants to get that temperature up because you could make transmission lines that are lossless if you could develop these materials. And so the record holders for the highest temperature that the material goes superconducting, the record is held by these close to these two materials. Notice this one has four metals in it. This one has five metals in it. But they, have, they got an entry. They got a simple material, lanthanum copper oxide, that superconducted at 40 Kelvin. And with some rational design, once they had the entry, they quickly moved it to above 100 Kelvin, or minus 170 uh, centigrade, but above liquid nitrogen temperature, which is a big one. All right, so it turns out in biomedical applications, they came up with a term called combinatorial chemistry, where if they were looking for a particular drug to bind to a particular receptor, they came up ways of generating hundreds and thousands of peptides at once and testing them on the receptor that they wanted very quickly to zero in on some drug candidates. Well, in material science, this has also been adapted. And so I was think, thinking about how I could do this. So our original approach is that what we do is we take metal nitrate salts, highly soluble, very commonly available, and we load up an inkjet printer with these solutions. And so instead of printing ink, we're printing metal nitrate salts. And we print them on conductive glass substrates. So all, every, all of you that have a laptop, you have a conductive glass screen because the screen is switching the pixels in your computer by conducting electricity to switch those pixels. So this is not an unusual material. It's transparent and conductive. Then what we do is we print these nitrogen, nitrate precursors and patterns over the top of this, and then we pyrolyze it to produce oxides. Nitrates decompose into oxides. And then we, we do is we take a, a laser and we scan that over the library in the solution and look for current. Where we see current, we have a composition that might be useful. So here's how we print. We actually print copper oxide, CuO, and iron oxide rust on every plate so that we have an internal standard. Both of these things work a little bit, so it's always telling us that we're getting something. But we want to compare. So this is a gradient pattern where it's 100% A here, 100% B here, 100% C here. And then the stoichiometry of ABC would be in principle in the very middle. Binary compounds would be near the edges. And then we have every stoichiometry at once in there. So this is the way we get around having to do millions of experiments. We do millions of them at once by doing this. And if you find a good spot, it's easy to print just that range and expand it to try to get on there. Here's a laser scanner. It's just like the, in the supermarket, we use governometer mirrors. Here's iron oxide printed, and this is a photocurrent map, a false color photocurrent map. Shows where we printed the iron oxide. I gotta go up. So here's a typical plate. You can see the rust here, it's red. We print them very thin, that's technical reasons. And then here's a case where we found a spot that looks pretty good, and then we were able to expand it and zero in, and, and this was one of our early hits, and we worked on that. So, okay, we got, We've done that a bunch, but then I had this thought. Well, 
I had a PhD graduate student, actually it was a University of Wyoming grad when I was still at Colorado State that got this whole thing to work. Crazy idea, good graduate student, nice thesis, nice paper. But we still got millions of things to look for. So I thought, well, I could form a company and get some smart engineers to make robots to do this 24 seven. Because it was venture capital heaven from renewable energy about 10 years ago when we did this. But I'm not interested in companies. I like to do science. I'm one of those guys that likes to. So the, the idea was, OK, we need this discovery part. We need this optimization part. And the problem was uh, this discovery thing. So I came up with an idea. It's called distributed research. There's a few examples of this. So we outsourced the problem. So we get students. So you're pretty much of a lay audience. You're not chemists. And, and I hope a few minutes I was able to explain the gist of this idea that you might have gotten it, right? Sure. Maybe not. Sure. Well, you got the inkjet printing and heating it up and then scanning the laser around it, maybe. All right, so the students have their future at stake, really. If they get interested in the energy problem, learn some chemistry, and we could recruit sophisticated materials labs like at the UW to follow up on their discoveries, find out what's really there and why it works and all that sort of thing, even maybe give them a scholarship to come in and follow it. So this uh, was kind of like the distributed computing model, but it's real research. These kids would have a real chance to discover something. So this is what we call it. We call it the Shark Project, the Solar Hydrogen Activity Research Kit. My son and 14-year-old Photoshop wizard in 20 minutes <laughs> came up with our logo. Uh, so, so far, we've, uh, we started at CSU with some guinea pigs, freshmen that took a lab course on Friday afternoon for three hours for no credit, well, for credit, but for no requirement. So I had about four kids showed up every Friday afternoon for three hours to be our guinea pigs to try to work out how the kids could do this. We finally got a Dreyfus Steve Grant, I'm sorry, I got to hit the wrong button there, to get this going. And we tested it out in 20 or 10 undergraduate schools. Uh, we created an online database and a bulletin board called thesharkproject.org. And in 19, or last year, we were named one of the top 10 citizen science projects of 2012. So here's what's in the kit. We give them a Lego Mindstorms kit to do the scanner, and I'll show you that. This is all the things, right about $650 now. So here it is. Here's our Lego Mindstorms laser scanner. You can see what we're doing is we're flashing this laser with just like this laser pointer, and it's scanning over a plate that's printed, like I said, in our cell that's made out of plate glass and aquarium cement, really cheap. We built a little electronics box that controls this off from a laptop, and this is just moving the mirrors to then raster it uh, X, Y, and Z and produce that photo current image for the kids. Though we've actually, this is kind of slow as you can see, we've actually re recently just developed a much faster scanner. And so this has gone to what we call our school of sharks. These are all of our sites right now. We have over 100, but we're running out of ability to support these people because we don't have a lot of funding for this. But we do have a, this, this has been picked up by the a Center for Chemical Innovation at Caltech, my alma mater, as their outreach project for a big NSF grant. And we have a retreat there every year. And last, just January, we were there. And we fly in a lot of the kids that are active in the shark program. And they give presentations and posters. And this has been one of the most gratifying things in my career. Sorry to the lawyers, but a couple of them came in and said, well, I thought I'd be a lawyer, but now I got doing this chemistry stuff. I really want to be a scientist. <laughs> and this were kids that were from Hispanic neighborhoods and disadvantaged neighborhoods in the LA area. Uh, and so to have these kids come in, they were excited about science. And it's real science. The point is it's a lot of problems to solve. This thing doesn't work smoothly all the time, which is like research. So they're learning. It's not, and they, and they, they were saying that, well, you know, when we did labs in chemistry, everybody got the same result and it got kind of boring. But here, everybody gets a different result and then you know, run into all these problems and I really like solving those problems. So we've been really gratified with that. All right, so I probably have uh, 
Well, actually, I'm in pretty good shape. We started a little late. Uh, <laughs> this is what, if you run, when I run into climate deniers, I love to think about this cartoon here. Uh, here's the, the climate summit with all the nice things that could happen, but the heckler, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> Thank you, Larry. <laughs>